Okay, thank you. So I think that we already have been cyberized more than enough, so I don't want to spend too much time on profiling our enemy. But what we have, what we have is, uh, okay, uh, what we have is a confusing keyboard. But basically, what we have is uh, security researcher Charlie Miller. We have activists. We have uh, professional criminals after money, uh, nation states, and then we have terrorists. But we already saw 40, 40 minutes of that, so let's get to the interesting topic. So what all of this means in practice? It, it doesn't really matter whether you are facing a terrorist, spy or somebody else. They all have pretty much the same limitations. Just like a regular malware, spy does need to have a code running in system. If he doesn't have code running in system, he cannot really attack. That's the key to all of these attacks. That means that the attacker has to be able to infect at least one device, and unless he was extremely lucky, he needs to be, move, be able to move wherever the things are interesting. So from defender's point of view, there actually isn't that much difference between your advanced corporate James Bond attack uh, or your regular criminal. They only have fancier toys. So that means that all of our attackers do need command and control access, they need to be able to directly attack, they need to be able to leak the stolen goods, and there are some differences. When we are talking about nation states, they have a lot more resources. So they do have actual zero days, they do have exotic attacks, they can bribe people. And then of course, the greater threat, threat in my opinion is that spy is patient. You are facing a government employee, and that government employee has more than enough time. And that basically means that uh, he will be patient. And nothing's more dangerous than a patient enemy. So that means that if you use a spy as your worst case, you're pretty much prepared against everything else, whether you worry about spies or not, but they are very good model enemy. That's how we think at F-Secure. We take the worst enemy we can think of, then we figure out how to stop that. And that pretty much takes care of everybody else too. Bloody hell. Excuse me. And that means that in the stage of attack, the first thing that the enemy needs to do is that he, he needs to reckon the environment and build an exploit and malware for attack. He needs to get in contact with the target because it, without contact, there can be no attack. But contact is not enough. He needs to get the target to run an exploit and be able to install malware either in the file system, in memory or somewhere else. If he doesn't have hostile code running in system, he doesn't have that particular system under control. And he needs a command and control access to be able to target uh, the beachhead malware. And after that, he needs to be able to move laterally within the target network so that he can actually find whatever is interesting in that particular target and then he needs to leak the valuables out, do the sabotage or do something else so basically profit and after that he needs to be able to persist as long as possible and this is kind of the chain that no matter whether we are talking about Stuxnet or we are talking about your common, common criminal the pattern of the operation is same which of course means that in order to have a good defense, it pays uh, much, much in uh, to focus on the early stage as much as possible. And why I'm talking about zero days today? Whatever defense mechanism kills zero days is pretty effective against all other forms of attack. So if attack and malware are unknown, then the detection-based methods don't work. Well, that's quite rather obvious. So traditional antivirus is no defense for zero days. So what do we need to do? We need to uh, create effective defense that targets the things needed by attacker. You cannot know what will be the next zero day. You can make a guess that it's most likely Flash, Java, Silverlight, PDF, etc. So you know what your attacker needs. He needs the victim to run uh, the platform where, where the exploit operates. So we start denying things needed for attack. Exploiting is impossible if the, f if the feature where the exploitable code is, 
is not enabled. A lot of these things can be done automatically by good endpoint protection, so that's what we are doing. But then again, I'm not here to sell uh, our products. Our products are supposed to be so good that they sell themselves. So I will be telling mostly on the stuff that are needed from you, in addition of just using our or any other high-quality security product. So the first thing you need to do is to hamper Recon. One thing to learn about attacks is that all attackers need to know what they are attacking. Exploits are very usually software specific and even more so software version specific. So that means that if you make your either remove the information that what software you are using or preferably lie, you are going to make your enemy waste a lot of time figuring out that exactly what that guy is running. And second thing is, of course, that the other way the attacker is going to figure you out is to attack your people and get them to tell what software you are using. So that means that you need to train your people to resist human, human intelligence. Basic things are that any technical questions should be done with Gmail or some other email account. Do not use real names when finding information. Do not answer detailed questions, etc. So this applies for everybody in your company, they should have and training how to resist human intelligence when somebody is trying to ask que probing questions and trying to figure out exactly your network. And of course, other basics is that you need to have own DNS servers for public and internal network. And of course, neither of those DNS servers should work as an open resolver. That's kind of obvious, but this is a failure that affects more than 50% of organizations. But then again, how dangerous it is that somebody could make queries on your public domain server? What could an attacker do just by making DNS queries? He can figure out what software you are using. The reason for that is that let's say that he wants to figure out what antivirus your company is using. He will make a query your uh, DNS server about the update server of used by particular antivirus software. If getting an answer takes time, so then the attacker knows that that domain name was not in the cache of the domain name server, which means that none of the other computers have been asking that recently. If the answer was very quick, then he knows that that was in cash. Okay, that guy is using that particular product. And this applies for everything because almost everything nowadays has some kind of an update telemetry or some other server. Just by being able to make a domain name queries, the attacker can map what kind of software you are using and from what vendors. He doesn't know the versions, but he knows the vendors. This is one very annoying the keyboard sorry and of course then le leaving fake traces on uh, open source intelligence forums etc about the software you are using is also a good idea the more difficult it make you make for the attacker to figure out what software you are using and what kind of and what versions the more the attacker has to spend time and even as the attackers are resourced, they do have bosses, they do have budgets, and they pretty much always go for the easy targets. Be difficult to figure out, and you might be able to cross the 10-hour border. That's the time attacker typically spends on figuring out the target. If they cannot find something in 10 hours, it basically means that they are going to move for easier targets, unless they have been specifically instru instructed to target you which is not mostly the case. They are telling that I want information from energy industry. It's not like that it would be a certain specific company. Sometimes yes, but mostly not. So, second thing in addition of hampering Recon that you can do is to use a proper endpoint protection. Most and this is basically the most single effective action you can do. Because the job of a good endpoint protection is to prevent the infection in the first place. Finding malware is very nice, 
But antivirus engine updates usually take from one to five days to discover new new malware binary, sometimes even longer. So that's not very useful. What you need to do is to find a product that focuses on prevention. The boxes I'm having there are the names that our product uses. Disregard that except that look for the kind of technologies you want to make sure that whatever vendor you are choosing is capable of providing. So infection prevention is the key. That's the reason why we have been doing so well in the AV test. We don't operate like a traditional antivirus company. We focus on preventing the system from being infected in the first place, rather than trying to find the signs of infections when the system has been taken over. So how does that work? The most important and the most effective, at least in our arsenal, and I would say that probably other, other vendors' arsenals too, is content pre contact prevention. Prevent contact and there can be no attack. Obvious things are firewalling services that are open by accident. Well, that's kind of obvious, but still hits many people, in the, many people in the groin. Second thing is that you want to filter out known malicious domains. AV updates can take up to days. URL updates, especially from vendors who have a good exploit kit identification, can be done in minutes. And that's a huge difference on the window of vulnerability. So it means that the first, at the first user will bite the bullet, at least on the network level, but the second one won't. And it's not usually that the attacks are totally, totally unique. Then, of course, even more effective way is the content type control, by which you limit the attack surface in the net. net. That basically means that watering hole that is blocked, where your user cannot go, is no use for the attacker. And most commonly used uh, web attack points are all kinds of forums, cafeterias, etc. Small sites, which are favored by certain population, either to, for to, to geor geographical location or something else. For example, figuring out that, okay, from that company's employees, probably quite a lot of people go to that particular school. Let's hack the school website. So when you limit the kind of places that you can use with business computers and telling them use their phones or something else for private browsing, you already limit the attack surface really significantly. And of course, when we are talking about signature-based detections, they are not completely useless. Exploit signatures are far more useful than antivirus signatures. Permutating Malware, so Windows 32 binary script or something else is ridiculously easy. Anybody can do that. Permutating an exploit is difficult and sometimes not possible, especially when the exploit detection is written smartly. So that already means that there are places where signature scanning is useful, but that is not in the scanning of binaries. And of course, other and even more effective method to protect against the con uh, attacker from having a contact is the fact that exploits do tend to come from throwaway domains. There's only certain amount of vulnerable websites that the attacker is able to find, and those are the crown jewels for the attacker. Attacker very rarely places the exploit on the compromised website. He has a redirection, and typically redirection from redirection into throwaway attack site. Because that way, it will take longer time for defenders to figure out that, oh, it's that page that has been compromised, and then you do an uh, abuse report to take it down or just filter it. So that means that when you start looking at the type of contents you allow from different types of websites, for example, okay, we don't know anything about this website. Let's kill Java, let's kill Flash, let's kill Silverlight, no PDFs, no EXEs. Uh, that's about 90% of attack surface. There's still HTML5 exploits and other HTML exploits, which are difficult to filter, but still, that is cutting the vulnerable attack surface significantly. And that actually does make sense for other things, but basically that's more than enough of advertising of products. So what you need to do by yourself is to do heavy filtering on email. Allow attachments only from known senders, Use DNSSEC to verify the sender so that nobody is simply forging the headers. Strip allowed attachments, no EXE, no JavaScript. Configure your web browsers in your organization 
to remove the first of all use HTTPS everywhere so that every site that supports HTTPS will use it in addition of that remove the CAs that you don't need for business use if you don't do business in China don't use CCN, CCNIC don't use Turk Trust don't use uh, and there's probably something like 30 dodgy certification authorities you shouldn't use they are dodgy because in those countries the police can demand the certification authority. Now we want a certificate for Google. And oh by, oh, by the way, you are under GAC order. You cannot ever talk about that. And that's happening a lot. So you always verify that you don't trust CAs who are not supposed to issue certificates that you need. And also using a VPN will make an update tampering and other kind of traffic injection attacks impossible. So also do regular DNS health checks. Make sure that nobody has compromised your DNS and do check that the DNS server is giving correct answers. That's an e probably the easiest way of compromising an organization. DNS server is just running there. Nobody pays attention to that. If attacker can compromise that, they can re redirect the traffic whichever way they want. So do have a DNS health check running all the time that the bloody thing is giving right answers, at least for your business critical locations. And then, of course, using a USB device control and training people not to plug in every free mouse they happen to receive from security conference is also highly advised. I'm going to actually investigate all the USB devices I got today, just out of curiosity. Other things that then a security software can do for you is prevention or detection of exploiting. First, and the most effective way of protecting exploits is really boring. It's using updates and using some kind of software that also updates all the software that your users have installed on the system. It's really boring, yeah, but 99.9% .9 of exploited vulnerabilities seen by Verizon, so really big ISP, were of CVE that was more than one year old. 99.9% .9 of attacks happen using exploits for which the patch has been available for a year. That's why actively scanning vulnerabilities is far more important than actively scanning for malware. Do, do make sure that all everything that has been installed, be it IT or be it user, is always maintained up to date. And then, in addition of that, good security pro software provides behavior detection, which then spots unusual activities done by exploited application. So in here, behavior monitoring of unknown binaries is difficult because the attackers do know how to disable behavior monitoring. So you need products that focus on behavior monitoring of the clean applications that are exploited in the first place, and be able to figure out that, okay, now that application is misbehaving, we kill that. And then the attacker cannot proceed because it, behavior of clean application is deterministic. So a product that is able to model the behavior of clean application and notice when it's out of line is going to be very effective. We have been about 50% effective against unknown ex uh, zero-day exploits. So when we have heard of zero-day, we have tested that against our system. 50-50. It's pretty good. It's better than the, the typical 100% uh, of zero-days getting true. Some days it have, has been over 80, but I don't like to make empty promises. 50-50 is something we can pretty good stick on. But anyway, other thing you can do is to disabling un vulnerable attack surface. So basically from all the software that handle code that could be coming from outside, disable all the features that your users don't need. How often have your users needed flash videos in PDF file? How often have they needed JavaScript in PDF file? If you kill JavaScript in a PDF file, you kill more than 80% of all PDF exploits I have analyzed so far. Limiting the capabilities of the software for things that your users actually need is extremely efficient on cutting down the attack surface. With minimal, minimal modifications, you can remove more than 80% of the uh, total export vo uh, volume available for the attacker. And that includes also zero days. It's always the same pieces of code that contain the shit that has been attacked for some reason. 
And then additionally, you can harden process memory handling. So basically all applications that handle external content, what you want to do is that you use uh, the memory hardening provided by operating system vendor or some other play like Microsoft Emmet or then Linux GR security and then apply that for all software that handles external connections. On 2013 I took and test test of 1000 real life corporate espionage document attacks so real attacks targeting real users and at least at that point using Microsoft Emmet killed all of them. I haven't repeated that research, so I cannot promise what's the situation in 2016. But so far we, we have seen security conferences where somebody is breaking Emmet, but we haven't that you seen used in use in real life attacks yet. And of course, there are plenty of books like uh, Antivirus Hacker's Handbook, which basically tells you how to defend, uh, defeat antivirus scanners. Yeah, we know that. So that's why we focus our resources on the things that attacker needs to do in order to defeat antivirus scanning and other antivirus mechanisms. For example, the fact that you bypass scanner means that you have to produce unique binary. Then we can use our security cloud to see that hmm, this binary is unique. And then depending on the configuration, either we don't let it run at all, or we put it extra strict monitoring if it does anything out of the line that's it. So basically, attacks are evolving, so you need the defense that is capable of evolving too. And we realized that back in 2008. So we have been enjoying, but now as there are other players finally having the same kind of technologies, we are free to speak it openly. And then other, basic, other nice basic tricks you can do is with file access permissions. Probably about 50 to 70 percent of malware create themselves into certain locations. And that's the re the, and reason for that is that there's only so many places in your Windows 7, 8, 10 where attacker can write and execute. And that our normal user can write and execute. An attacker has to be used that at least for the first stage payload. But many of those places where the attacker wants to write are the ones where user is not watching. So that's why what you want to do is to deny you know, creation and execution of files in these locations. And that's basically these routes. If you prevent file creation in these locations, you will not inconvenience user at all. Because no user ever creates an exe to root of program data. Or in the root of program files, or even in root of app data. But then again, malware does that very frequently, especially when they need a safe place to drop from an exploit. They don't have a long time uh, when the acrobat crashes, and if it's frozen in the screen, they have to operate in milliseconds. Otherwise, user will start figuring out that there's something really funny going on, and because of that, they will then uh, be able, to, uh, they will then uh, uh, attack the system, uh, they will be able to move, have to move on. And the same thing also applies that there are some places where you have to app, uh, allow file creation and because of that you can still block execution. Why you know somebody would, uh, somebody would execute an exe from recycle bin? This doesn't kill all and this doesn't kill APT but it does kill a lot of common criminals. And my last and favorite trick is to pretend to be malware analyst. A lot of malware, if they see system administrator or analysis environment, will be totally silent. They try to avoid sandboxing and system administrator from detecting that way. In, in, run sys internals process explorer and you kill more than 80% of modern malware. So, use that. However, be aware that some malware do retaliate, but I prefer formatted C drive in the over-infected system every day, but I do have backups. And that basically means that you create these kind of traces on the system. These have been taken from real malware, and these are the things real malware looks in order to spot is there system, system administrator in here, or is there malware analyst in here. Install these traces on all of your systems. 
And thanks to that, the attacker doesn't know, is, is he on a real system or is he on a su uh, system admins or malware analyst sandbox. And then, of course, it's a really good idea to use firewalls to hamper lateral movement, so that the network is supposed to be really strict also on inside. You are not supposed to have every port open. The more strict the network is, the more difficult it is for enemy to move around. So, in conclusion, malware has evolved. Methods based on old-fashioned scanning are almost useless, except against common mal malware and last line of defense. Modern protection focuses on preventing infection. Malware is easy to permutate, but exploit vectors, they are finite set. Use your constriction there and the enemy will have trouble. And if protection fails, anomaly detection is the tool to go, not scanning. Scanning is nice when you know that there's something to search for, but antivirus products do that automatically for you. Use your brains and your resources to figure out what kind of anomalies the enemy makes? How can I spot those anomalies? And use that to find your, uh, find your enemy. So, anyway, I thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Th thank you to Jarno Nimela. So my takeaway here is that uh, we have to fight on all fronts and then we have some chance of surviving because you really did cover a lot here. Um, I have to inform you that uh, for the people looking at this online, uh, there is an option of asking questions through Twitter. You use hashtag uh, DSSITSEC2015. Uh, but maybe we have one quick question here in the audience. I do have one, uh, if I may. Um, so you did, you didn't uh, emphasize that, but on a couple of slides you mentioned uh, JavaScript, and it's a favorite topic for me personally. Uh, so you actually suggest there are, there are some scenarios where blocking JavaScript entirely in the web browser would uh, would be helpful. No, uh, blocking JavaScript on your PDF reader and everywhere else is helpful. So block JavaScript where it's not being used. And also using a no script and domain reputation so that you allow JavaScript only for known trusted sites is a good idea. But unfortunately that breaks a lot of the web. But then again, Flash, who needs that really on anything else than a couple of video player sites? Okay, let's th thank again and welcome our next speaker. Thank you so much. And uh, here is a gift from DSS for being able to make it, and thank you for a great presentation. Black Falls, nice. Oh, yes.